It's time for Mac Break Weekly. So much to talk about. Of course, the big story, Mark Gurman's scoop, that Apple might be abandoning Intel in a couple of years. The panel has their thoughts on what a future would look like without Intel in the Apple camp. We'll also talk about the new iPad. Renee and Andy both have their hands-on review. It's all coming up next. Oh, and iOS 11.3, brand new. It's all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 604, recorded Tuesday, April 3rd, 2018. Intel Outside. MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by TurboTax Live, new from TurboTax. Now you can get a personal review of your tax return with a CPA or EA right on your screen. Talk live with a tax expert as often as you need for tax advice to help you file with confidence. Go to TurboTaxLive.com slash MacBreak. And by Molecule. Molecule is the world's first molecular air purifier that reduces symptoms for allergy and asthma sufferers. For $75 off your first order, visit Molecule.com and enter the promo code MACBREAK. And by Wink, the best way to discover new wines you'll love. Go to TryWink.com slash MACBREAK and get $20 off your first shipment. It's time for MACBREAK Weekly, the show where we cover the latest Apple news with Apple journalists like Andy Anako from the fabulous Celestial Waste of Bandwidth. A well-known evening paper in the galaxy, Orion. Hello, Andrew. We, thank you very much. We, we've added morning delivery, afternoon delivery. We don't even care if you're on the toilet. We'll, we'll still <laughs> serve you. Everywhere you are. Hot, fresh slices whenever you want. <laughs> Great to have you, Andy. Uh, Renee Ritchie's joining us from, oddly enough, not from Montreal, but from San Francisco. Hi, Renee. Hi, Leo. Yeah, last minute travel. I'm hosting a party at the AT&T store uh, about distracted driving awareness. Uh, I had to you, link up earlier, so hopefully. Did you go home from Chicago and then come back to San Francisco? Yes, it was unexpected. I was supposed to do this party while I was, and then I had to go to Chicago, so they delayed the party, and now we're doing it this week. So. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Well, it's a good cause. Welcome to San Francisco. <laughs> Thank you so much. The wrong part of it, sadly. Not uh, hey, we're not that close. It's okay. And joining us uh, right next to me, oddly enough, Alex Lindsay from the Pixel Core. Hello, Alex. Hi. And I have a new, I have a new show. What's your new show? It's called The Teardown. You'll love it. Ooh. It so, sounds like you're breaking it's things on YouTube. apart. I, I, uh, uh, it's on our YouTube channel. Um, it is... Uh, I, I look at other people's broadcasts and I, I tear pick, them down. I, yep, I pick at them. <laughs> oh my god, that's uh, with a with a telestrator. That's bold of you. Yes. With a telestrator. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think so, that might be an occupational hazard. I was at the I, you know I, I was at the barber shop so, yeah, yesterday. I'm not messing around. I just went straight for CNN. You went to the CNN. Yeah, I was at the barber shop yesterday. And we were watching ESPN, and I and I said, Lisa, that's a very poor green screen. And I was showing her what was wrong with the uh, key that they were using. Right. Because they were at a, a, a desk. Boy, I want to be on your show. <laughs> they were at a desk. And, right. you know, you could have a real mm -hmm. desk. But nowadays, if, you know, you just you key the background. Okay, I expect that. But they also key the desk. So they have some generic white oh, right. desk. Oh, and they horrible. key the whole thing. And But the reason it was a dead giveaway is they had this ref supposedly reflection of them going all the way down the front of the desk. And I said... What angle would that work? Would that work where you see his head here <laughs> yeah. and then down there, a reflection of his head? Right. That is, it's even looking at it, it bugs me. It's right. nonsensical, but I guess they think it's slick. Well, and, right? you know, and, and so what are you doing? Is that the kind of thing you're doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's uh, the, the, uh, well, if you jump in it a little bit more, this is I, like I like I, I picked at this. The, it, oh, here, I have the alias playing back video. Uh, oh yeah, you're picking. Oh, look at this. I, I I explained why they were having trouble with that. Why that that render isn't good. Um, oh my god, is, this is uh, great stuff. And I broke I broke it. I, you know, I break down like they're not. The polygons aren't well formed, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> like they, like, and I was like, the only way to fix this is that if is you uh, go back and refix it. And then, um, yeah. you know, then I start, I talked here about mic placement. And then the second one I do, uh, um, I just, just talked about insert studios because insert studios drive me crazy. What's an insert studio? An insert studio is, I actually explain it in the show, but the insert studio is what everybody you see on CNN 
uh, is in an insert studio, like when they're talking heads. They're in a studio that oh, they're yeah. sta- sitting. Basically, when I'm when I come into Mac Break from You're somewhere, insert studio. I'm in a, I'm in our insert yeah. studio, and so I show a picture of our insert studio. But then I, sh- I start going from one insert studio to another and talking about the bad key, the the background, and, and the ones that are good. I'm not just just attacking things. I'm you know pointing out like this works or this doesn't work or. You know, that kind of thing. So I would imagine that this would be must see TV for the folks, the engineers at CNN and everywhere else, right? I think, uh, unless they're offended, they, they might be offended. <laughs> I'm pretty, no, it's pretty producers were offended. It's pretty rough. And I, and I have to admit, after the first two, I'm, I'm starting to, uh, <laughs> this is, I'm his, starting to get, this starting is to get my stride. Studio, yeah. yeah. So I'm just talking. <laughs> yeah. Like, so, so is this going to be like Mystery Science Theater 3000 with like a, a silhouette of you, like just making fun of like we have Joe, hairs that aren't being Give vetted? the man a telestrator. There's no, oh, look there. That's an insert studio. That's my insert. Yeah. That's our insert studio. That's what you're looking at when you're joining us yeah. with the green screen behind it. And then I'm just explaining the keys and the, you know, like what they're, you know, how they're doing each one of these. So she's not in front of an actual. Uh, uh, I think she's in front of a screen. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, she's in front of a. Uh, a, a green screen, I think. Yeah, it's actually a pretty screen. good. It's actually a pretty good. That's a good key. key. Her it, hair the looks problem pretty... really there was exposure, which I was talking about. Yeah, there she's way thing. dark. Yeah, it's, she's dark because that feed is really, really bright, and it's just really hard right. to properly. She's getting expose. blown out by the. Uh... And then this one, I was talking about the headroom, which is a little much. Um, and the fact <laughs> God, that I just, I hope you never do See? our shows. <laughs> 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 and oh then, my God, and then that's they have terrifying. there's aliasing that's going down behind her, which is either a, a scrim that's too close or a monitor. Oh, and I was talking a little bit about the bad oh. lower thirds. Yeah, and and uh, oh, you're hysterical. And um. And then I, uh, like, this is the, see, you can see the scrim there, right? There's like a little texture there. Yeah. And she's too close to the scrim. So it's not outside of the depth of field. <laughs> and so I'm explaining, like, like what, what happened and, Alex, and, and how to, how to fix this, it. At this point, I'd like to point out that uh, I really am still setting up everything in this <laughs> new studio. <laughs> that the, that the, this background is going to be way See that glare behind back. Andrew there <laughs> over his right the shoulder. lights aren't nearly as well set up as I'm going to have them. Well, I was, I call it the teardown. I was like, I'm up too rough. That's a someone, good name. Someone in the office said you should call it the Grim Reaper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. But there's no, definitely no, just, just just make just make sure people know you're talking about tear down people's self esteem, yeah. their pride in their work, yeah. and their there's definitely ones. I was working on one last night that I'm going to post later this week, and I and I and I looked at the Al Jazeera set, and it's all I'm talking about is how much I love it because this it looks like a spaceship and it's got all this great stuff. And I, but I explained what 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 all the things are too. So it's not just Tearing something down. It's also like what explaining works. like what well, let's works. Let's look and at also this uh, Bloomberg uh, set. By the way, this is a perfect example of. I'm going to go back a little bit of one of those fake keyed sets, like that desk. I can't stop it, unfortunately. But the desk they're behind is obviously a fake desk. The whole thing. What they're talking about though is of great interest to us. This is Mark Gurman's uh, scoop. Apple plans to use its own chips in Macintosh. Are we surprised? No, um, I guess this all makes uh, sense. Well, yes, and it's been rumored since yes 20, 20, what, 11? Yeah. But rumor, yeah, I mean, yes. this is still a rumor. We should point out this is not yes. a new, this is maybe a more confirmed rumor. And yeah. I think it does well, make sense now. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I mean, it makes perfect sense for a lot of reasons. Uh, Apple obviously likes control. They're frustrated with Intel's uh, schedule. They can't blame Intel for the lack of real updates for the Mac in forever. Uh, but they would also allow them to integrate everything together a lot better. The reason why you get so much performance out of the iPad isn't necessarily just because of their A10X processor, but because of how, how well and tightly uh, integrated it is with the operating system, the rest of the hardware, everything else. Uh, the only thing that uh, the, the only thing that kind of uh, I disagree with, actually definitely disagree with, I don't think that Apple would plan to uh, transition the entire Mac line over to uh, over to their own designs, unless they're will unless they've got the the mojo to design something better than the uh, than the ARM platform, because I just don't see them spinning up enough experience to make something that could power uh, an iMac Pro, something that could, you know, do uh, film editing, something that could do special effects, uh, art, uh, 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 machine learning models, uh, VR, stuff like that. So uh, I've actually just wrote something that's going to hope that might even be up on uh, Fast Company uh, later today or right now. I filed it like uh, like the early this morning. Uh, that basically made the I made the idea that either they'll use this that the the biggest impact is going to be on the consumer level Macs, uh, like the MacBook Air, like the MacBook Nothing, because 
it's uh, it doesn't have a whole lot of demands. It can benefit the most from uh, custom CPUs. Uh, it could even cut the price down so that they could finally start making some form of Macintosh notebook for less than nine hundred or eight hundred dollars. Or if this is the way of sort of nudging the Macintosh out of <laughs> out of the world and start getting people to transition from Mac OS to iOS by making the next version of Mac OS, uh, Mac OS something that is a lot more like iOS rather than cross pollinating the two, uh, which is something we've been talking about for 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 a while. So I just uh, I think we should really look at this Bloomberg <laughs> set here, uh, Alex. Would you like to take the uh, the pen and uh, and comment on it? Uh, that's clearly a fake desk. It's got a lot know, of gloss think, on it. You I think, think it's, it's real? Fake, I think it's a real desk. But I think that you know the problem that you usually get into with this stuff here <laughs> is that. Uh, Shall I zoom in? Let me yeah. let me zoom. In. Oh, you need you know what you need a Surface Studio to to oh, do this. Well, mine's actually. Uh, I'm pretty. My 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 setup's pretty. You got a pretty good one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm um, not surprised. The. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Enough. Yeah. Let, you go watch Alex's thing. I don't want to. <laughs> this is Mac Break Weekly. We got actual yeah. Apple news here. Let's uh, let's uh, let's talk about. It. So, I, what is the what I, is the reason, Renee, that Apple? First of all, why is this such a credible rumor? The stock market believes it. Uh, tanked Intel stock uh, you know, significantly. I mean, the, stock market's the stock market's ridiculous because the Apple's five percent of Intel's business, and even if they moved, and Neil Patel made this point yesterday, even if they moved off the Intel platform. They're not going to make chips for anybody else. Everyone else will still be buying Intel. So that's right. just emotional, right. you know, typical stock market stuff. But the uh, so I think past is prologue here. And what we saw with Marklar, which was the Intel transition, they named it after the alien species from South Park, which I still love to this day. They had the <laughs> Intel Macs running in the closet, like in the lab, for a long time because they had to, you know, they had to get Mac OS ported, they had to get Safari ported, they had to get all the major stuff ported. And they were just there in case, in case at some point they made the decision that based on, on PowerPC's roadmap, they needed to change direction. And that happened. And Jeff McLaren uh, reminded me this morning that PA Semi was all set to start making PowerPC chips for the Mac when Steve Jobs changed his mind and went Intel and then later bought PA Semi. And that entire team became the Apple A-series team that makes the chips now for and those all are, the iPhones and iPads. Those are ARM platform-based uh, chips. Would... The Mac power chip, arm, yeah. power arm, power arm, because it's a little power, yeah. a little bit of power, a little bit of arm. Would uh, would they be using that same chip family for Macintosh as well? And then, so, what would that mean for Mac OS? So, I think in general, I mean, they've they've, they've had Mac arms, uh, they had Mac running on ARM for years. People have had it in the closet because you have to be ready. And Intel has had an incredibly hard time going to 10 nanometer. They they went from their TikTok cycle to TikTok, talk, 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 talk. I mean, every three minutes, I turn around and they're announcing an interim. Um, architecture change. They just they just, by the they way, just they just announced another one this morning. Another one, <laughs> another one. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, their their roadmap right now is is probably every bit as dicey to Apple as our as uh, Power PCs was when they made that transition. So that has to be ready to go. And you know, Apple let an intern do some of the porting, and he published his paper years ago about getting Mac on ARM. But, but I have so to many say, I, I am running Windows on ARM right now. And it is not a pleasant experience because it only does right now Windows 32 bit, and it and it runs like a dog on a uh, Snapdragon 835. But one of the advantages Apple would have designing its own silicon is they could make. I guess I presume they could make it be more responsive. It could well, they could better. do several things. Like we we saw we saw last year and this year. Like Samsung is probably one of the best fabs in the world, and they're a generation or two generations behind what Apple's doing. With silicon, like the the right. A series chip are just best in industry now. But also, there's, Apple has had years to make Mac run when well on ARM. They've also had years to make specific ARM chips to run Mac if that's what they want to do. There's always the potential they could somehow get AMD to make x86 or or license x86 chips to them to make their own custom x86 chips. There's hybrid solutions like they're doing now with some part of it run with an ARM chip and some part of it run with x86. And there's also like they did previously interpreters. Uh, which aren't great either, and usually impact the same high-performance software. That's the only reason you want the x86. So you're to saying, with. so you're saying then that this wouldn't, this doesn't anyway necessarily mean the end of Mac OS. Oh, but, not at all. But I look at this and I worry that that's what oh, is going on here. Now we've talked before about marzipan, which besides being a lovely almond treat, is <laughs> the uh, kind of unified so software platform that would allow iPhone, iPads, iOS stuff to run on Macs, right? Is that yeah? A, it would share is, the logic. Yeah, sorry. Is that a relation? Yeah. Is that a related? 
technology. I think it's like when you see like Apple announced size classes and there was no real reason to announce them. And then you got bigger yeah. iPads, side by side yeah. apps and bigger iPhones. You know, so you always look to what Apple's going to announce and it might right. be Marzipan. It might be something that does similar. But the idea there is just because there's so much iOS stuff, like people are complaining there won't be any games on Mac. If you can run iOS game on the Mac, you've solved the problem yeah. for 80 percent of the of the gaming market. And and, I don't think and, Apple would do this transition without being carefully planned. Well, and interestingly, both Fortnite and uh, PUBG, which are yeah. big PC games running on iOS right now. And by the way, yeah. running really nicely on uh, iOS. Yeah. Well, and I think that one of the things that this one of the advantages this gives Apple is that you know you have Intel making uh, chips that have to cater to everybody. Apple being a small percentage of that, everybody. You have uh, Windows being yeah, Apple written. Apple doesn't like that. They don't like to be five percent of a market. Exactly, and yeah. then you have Windows, which is written for lots of different platforms. And so both of them are kind of generalized. They're not specialized to what Apple necessarily wants. So by controlling their own chipsets, and I think that they will start with the consumer ones and eventually. But move this is, towards professional. Steve Jobs always said, well, you got to make hardware and software. Well, and, and, the, and the more they make their own hardware and the more they make their own software, number one is they're not underwriting everybody else's development. Number two is that they're not, you know, because that's what I mean with Samsung, even the stuff that they hire, they, they buy from Samsung. I'm not saying they're doing it immediately, but I think that Apple, this, there's this slow churning of Apple they, wanting to take over most of the key components like of everybody their, out of that. Yeah, and, and maybe they still have Foxconn assemble it. Well, but they also, but, but, I don't think Apple wants to make accelerometers or. I mean, right. they, they no no they they'll, they'll, they'll all those little bits and pieces, part. but no no it's it, it's the same thing everything that everything everybody wants you you want to you basically you want to control the things that make you different you want to commoditize yeah. the things that that um that don't make you different that are that are that are kind of done so commoditize all those things and but but like for instance I think that eventually Apple will want to do its own displays because that makes them different well and that's another rumor we've talked about already which is that they have a fairly uh, oh, ad yeah. advanced. Uh, R and D project working on this new micro LED technology right. that Samsung showed at CES, right. um, and Apple apparently has a thirty five thousand square foot factory uh, down in uh, Cupertino where they're or Sunnyvale where they're. they're you can imagine them starting with a watch this. for something like this, but eventually moving to their phones. And and again, if Apple's able to build all of those things, they have a unique advantage as far as how fast they can innovate. Um, and and well, they're how, already how, out and innovating how, Intel, right? So we're seeing that already. They also oh, solves I mean, their supply. There also solves the supply chain problems, right? right. Because they, they're just and in leaks. time and leaks. And Andy, you don't think teaching, it's a good idea? Uh, they're teaching you, Samsung how to do things that Samsung then uses on their own phones. Are you worried about performance, Andy? You think that no, Apple's no, I'm, not I'm, scooping Intel at this point? I don't think they're outperforming Intel. I think that Intel is the business of making CPUs. Apple is in the business of making entire pieces of hardware. So those are different opportunities to get uh, not just uh, performance enhancements, but battery enhancements. Uh, and Microsoft and Intel, they work. They do work very intimately together to make sure uh, to make sure that. Uh, Intel is building chips that are in line with Microsoft's strategies for Windows. Uh, all I'm saying is when I, when I was speaking speaking earlier before, all I was saying is that. Um, I don't see Apple being able to dump Intel the way that uh, they were able to dump PowerPC. I mean, it was immediately, it's like a switch was turned. There is, an, there is going to be an emulation. There's going to be an emulation layer, uh, Rosetta, for people who, ha who are stuck with old machines, but the future is entirely Intel. Uh, I don't think they're in a, they're in a position to... Uh, again, make and make a workstation class computer with their own chip technology. Yet that might change in five years, but that's also enough time for Apple to come up with something uh, beyond Macintosh for their future. And uh, as I as I keep saying, I hope it uh, doesn't sound like a broken record, but it is something that I, uh, I sincerely believe. Apple just has not shown enough enthusiasm for the Mac to make me take off the table the idea that Apple has an end of life already planned for the Mac. I'm not predicting it. I'm not saying that's already there, but I absolutely, every, anything I, any, uh, anytime I think about or speculate about the future of the Mac, it has to include the possibility that Apple has already picked a date. It's circled on the calendar and here is their plan for transitioning all the Mac users either onto iOS or to whatever workstation class computing that they feel comes after macOS. A guy named uh, Andy Anako wrote a really interesting article in <laughs> a fast company uh, <laughs> called The Fifth Age of Macintosh, What Happens If Apple Dumps Intel? And as you point out, only Apple knows what it's planning. But we've said, and we've said before, uh, that as long as you have to use a Mac to write software for iOS, Apple can't kill yeah. Mac OS. But you see them playing. I mean, I think I think that Swift Playgrounds is Apple slowly moving well, that's towards what the, the process. This story made yeah. me think of that. Is oh well, if they get everybody right in Swift, then it's a simple switch in the yeah. compiler, not 
that a, a developer could just recompile and suddenly it's native. Uh, I don't even. I don't even want to say it's, ARM. It's native a, a processor. I, I think. I think. Get. I think if Apple is planning to making any plans that are contingent on getting Mac developers to switch to Swift, I think that is about as likely as them getting into the cookie business. Really? I don't think that. I. I you're not going to get to. You. Are, Apple has enough problems trying to get Mac developers to simply support the APIs that they're yeah. requiring them to to make. They're getting. They're getting enough pushback on just getting them to uh, keep their apps on the App Store. I mean, there is. This well, is. But a, this Andy, is that's that's one of the arguments that they kill Mac OS is that people develop for iOS regardless of what tools or technologies are required because they can make a ton of money well, and I think that on iOS but but well, if they can't, if they can't they persuade them the to Mac, use technologies they want them to use on Mac OS that because there's not as much money to be made then there, there's two separate things there too is that one is that it's not just Swift they can recompile James Thompson was talking from Peacock was talking about this in the morning it, except for things that are really down, you know, lower levels abstraction. Yeah, it's a it's switch in Xcode for any project, yeah. no matter what you're yeah, writing absolutely. it in. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And the if they if they do project like Marzipan, then they have a wealth of iOS apps that they would need completely new interfaces, but they would still have all the logic and all the data models and everything that's much easier to bring to the Mac. Mm -hmm. Well, and also the the not, the when those uh, iOS <laughs> for Mac developers, the 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 thing is when the iOS apps suddenly become available on the Mac. There's a whole new layer of competition, you know, from those from those pieces. And the thing to look at is how not over how do we convert developers over the next year or two. It's how do we you know, they're working, obviously, based on last week from high school, you know, from grade school to have people learning how to write Swift. You know, that that is a that's a 10 year plan to to move a certain kind of programmer you know, to a point where they're generating revenue on the platform. There's another data point in this is which is that even Microsoft seems to be moving away from Windows. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons Intel stock took such a hit is that there was also a story that week that yeah. that Terry Meyerson, who's run Windows at Microsoft for almost a decade, is out. He's not even working at the company anymore. And that Microsoft, it uh, what was the headline? It was a great headline I read somewhere. Microsoft is effectively demoting Windows and saying uh, services are our future. And if that's the case, then they just as soon develop for Macintosh or iOS, whatever the platform is. And in fact, that's exactly what Microsoft has done. They make really good I, iOS stuff. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't know about that. I mean, the, the first thing that when Steve Ballmer left, the very first thing that was that uh, that the new CEO did was take uh, uh, take office for uh, the. Uh, office for Mac for the cloud uh, for the iPad and immediately take it from something they've got in their back pocket to something they put in the front burner. Uh, I the, the the thing about the thing about that reorganization is that uh, yes they did uh, sort of demote Windows status from sort of a, a secretary cabinet level position to <laughs> a part of a larger box. But the thing is, as far as I know, they haven't let go a lot of engineers from the Windows team, which means that I don't think that they think that they're going to need a, a need less development for Windows. I think the problem is, and this is very, very relevant for Apple, is that um, – uh, and this is something that I put I put in that Fast Company article. The model of screen, keyboard, pointing device isn't going anywhere. They, no one has come up with anything that can do uh, this thing that only this this model can do and continues to be important. The different the, the effect that uh, that's uh, that's having that's taking place now though is that all the stuff that you don't necessarily need a notebook for or a desktop for is being bled off by tablets and by phones. So. Apple is going to find itself in a position, I, if that's true, I think that Apple is going to find itself in a position where it's going to be harder and harder to maintain uh, the the Mac, the consumer MacBook market because uh, you're not, people don't, because of the cloud, people don't need to uh, upgrade nearly as often as they have to because now you used to buy a new computer because you need more CPU, you need more storage, you need more memory. Now you're essentially renting that uh, off of a server, so that's not quite so important. Uh, and now that there, uh, there are few people who are upgrading, fewer people who are necessarily buying, and you're still competing with really really good windows machines this this might be my uh, this is my, might be a case of uh, my selection bias i freely admit but it's i can imagine apple thinking that this is not a this is not a uh, people are buying lots and lots and lots of macbooks but they're mostly buying macbook pros i don't think the mark that the uh, shipments of macbook airs and macbook nothings is really really setting burn uh, setting the the barn burning i think that they're I imagine that they're thinking about the MacBooks, the consumer level Macs, the same way that they used to think about the iPods, where 
we're making money with them. It's a good business. However, this isn't going to continue to grow the way that uh, the business, our business would grow if we took those iPod users and moved them on to iOS devices. So that's why I can easily imagine Apple saying, let's chart, let's figure out a way to take consumer MacBook users and move them on to iOS devices, even if that means making a more powerful version of iOS and making hardware that is a little bit closer to a MacBook than an iPad. And I think for 90% of the MacBook users, if you gave us, you know, if we had the experience of a keyboard and, you know, things like that, and we had a touchscreen, if you mix those two things together and made it an iOS thing, most of us would use it. I mean, the Is problem, that what I, Apple's going to do? I think eventually. I a mean, I hybrid? Think that, I think we're going to see a hybrid. I think that's how you convert people over. That's how you convert me. Like, you know, there's, I'm not quite ready to, you know, I still, a you large haven't moved portion, to Windows yet. <laughs> like I everybody moved, else <laughs> i've not moved to windows i still haven't moved up to the i haven't moved up to the newer mac no me neither um, i'm still like you using yeah. a 15 inch 2015 but, yeah. i mean there is a there is a MacBook real problem Pro. with uh, with intel like I, as much as you, whether you like the new macbook pros or you don't they shipped really late because intel just didn't have that's another processors point. that apple right. needed they right. also they've pushed display port uh, but does two, that two explain behind on display port does now. that explain why the, the mac memory. mini hasn't been updated that's not intel's fault why no, I mean <laughs> Apple could throw whatever processor they want in there, but they but the when with the computers they do want to ship are also delayed right. because they're way they're totally dependent on Intel's roadmap, and that roadmap has significantly hurt their features. Like they wanted to have the low power RAM in much higher configurations, and they couldn't. They wanted to have the, the, all these things that would have made those computers more powerful and probably gotten them less heat from pro level developers, so, and it just simply wasn't ready on time. So Mark says oh, this oh. is as soon as 2020. That's two years off. Tell us, tell as me as soon as as soon as, but tell me what. Well, two things. First of all, <clears throat> this is going to be a really interesting May and June because we're going to have <laughs> Microsoft's Build Conference where we're going to, I think, get an idea of what Microsoft's seeing as the future. And it may be progressive web apps, which would solve this problem, right? Because those run on anything. Uh, then we're going to see Apple and Google in June. And I think it's going and to be Google does not use Intel. Like Google's making a ton of computers that do not use Intel. Right. Well, that's actually, amazing. they make the Pixelbook does use Intel, but you're right. That's a that's a well, minor. Well, I mean, they're they're investing that's a minor in heavily now too. Yeah. So I think this is going to be. I would be very interesting, and we will cover heavily the keynotes at all three events, and this will be a very interesting couple of events and couple of months where we might get a better insight into yeah. how this landscape I mean, is it's, changing. It's been changing all along, right? I mean, how people use computers. But so now, here's the question I want for all three of you. Let's say it happens in 2020 or 2021. What's that going to look like? What is this? What is what is? Will the iPad still be here? The iPhone will obviously still be here. What will the Mac look like? Go ahead, Renee. You start, and then uh, we'll, we'll each of you get a chance. What is it going to look like? Uh, yeah, I think the simplest answer is, is Apple just transitions the entry level computers, the lower power computers, the more portable mobile computer line to an ARM based platform. The yeah, the MacBook goes ARM. Whether they do Mac OS do on ARM. Do they do a the hybrid tablet like the Surface Pro where you have a detachable keyboard, or do they do a I mean, standard I, laptop? I just made a whole video asking for that, so I'm obviously biased <laughs> in, in, in my wishes, but I think that would be a fantastic product that a lot of people would just love, especially yeah. uh, in education and other environments. Um, and then you, you, you mature, it's the same strategy they're doing now. You bring the MacBook more towards the iPad, the iPad more towards the MacBook, and those two computers fight it out to be the best possible solution. Okay. How about you, Alex? What do you expect? 2021, the new world... I order. think that between now and then, I, I agree with Renee that, that it's going to be consumer. Start the, you can start with the basic end. stuff because because you still need an iMac Pro. You still need a Mac Pro. I think you so. do. I think there's still there's still a group of people that still need need the the the, the faster processors. And how that's long just is be that around for though? I think it'd be five or ten years. I mean, I think that there's there's a there's a lot of work there that I think that is going to be difficult to do with uh, you know without Intel for a while because a lot of the code is really written to that to that hardware, and I think that it's not going to be trivial to move Maya, for instance, or or something else over, and or big computational stuff. So I think that that's going to be that's going to take some time. I think that in between now and twenty in twenty twenty, I think we see this year or next year we see an iPad Pro that you know, really starts to bridge that it doesn't, you don't have to put arm on the, on the base laptop. You can make the iPad, the iPad pro a little more powerful. You know, if, if, if it really feels like, like for instance, if you gave me an iPad pro where it was easy to use a mouse and it came with a keyboard and I could lock it in and pull it out, <laughs> I, I might cut my, my CPU time into half. You know, it's just that there's this funny thing where it's very inefficient to only use a keyboard and a trackpad 
and it's very inefficient to only use your fingers. There's this hybrid that Apple hasn't been able to really, in my opinion, cross very well. Like the, the there's a lot of things like like use OmniGraffle or even Keynote. Those things are just painful on the iPad, in my opinion, because they're just they're trying even, to make that frankly, work. Frankly, even editing video is easier with touch, to be honest with you, and music. I mean, logic. It be, it's hard to be logic precise. Of, okay. So I, I find it easier to throw things together, but really hard to have those precise edits that I'm used to. You know, it's just that that that's where touch doesn't isn't as powerful, in my opinion. Right. And and so I think that there is this hybrid that Apple could do with the iPads before they did anything with the Mac that would get a lot of us just starting to use that a lot more if, if, we, if they just gave us that kind of in-between. I think the danger is, of course, is that suddenly you have iPad apps that, that are really expecting you to have other inter interfaces, you know, and that's something that Apple doesn't necessarily want other than the, than the pencil. Yeah, so I mean, this is going to take – and it, it, the early warning system would be developers because this is going to take a lot of change – in development and, and the yep. way developers think about user interfaces and screens. So we'll get an early warning system, as you pointed out, Renee. Every we'll find out about this stuff, yeah. you know, with developers first. Andy, what do you think? Um, I'd be surprised whether it happens in 2020, 2022. I think that what happens is consumer Macs, as we recognize them now, disappear. That iOS sort of expands to become capable of doing the stuff that a MacBook Air. <laughs> Uh, or a MacBook, nothing uh, does today. Uh, hopefully, it'd be through an entirely new interface. It would also open up Apple to create really interesting devices like the one that you've got in front of you right now. Like imagine uh, uh, the, the 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 analog to an iMac being a 24-inch touch touchscreen tablet that can be put flat on a, flat on a desktop and or, or a set up like an easel. Just, like, just as you say, I do prefer editing video via touch because it's just faster and it's more intuitive. Uh, but yet you can also put it onto, uh, put it upright and then have a keyboard and some sort of pointing device with it. Uh, and then I think that Mac OS remains as, there's a, there's a Mac Pro line that has something that is convention, a more conventional windowing mouse pointer E sort of interface. Uh, I can't imagine Apple wanting to get rid of the high ground of, uh, of creation uh, by sticking totally to, uh, to, uh, to consumer level devices. But the thing is, their love is for iOS. They don't. They don't hate Mac OS. They don't resent it. They don't want it to die. But that's every whether it's the stuff that they actually put into the Apple Store, the stuff they say during keynotes, uh, or just con uh, kind of conversations I have with current people who work for Apple and people who have recently left Apple. Uh, I feel as though their real love, their real passion, is for iOS. And whenever they think about the future of uh, of Apple. They're not really thinking. They're thinking. They're thanking the Mac very much for its service. Just like you have an employee who's 65, 66, 67 years old, you think you know that you can probably get another five good years out of them, but you may as well cut them loose now uh, and give his give his office space and his budget to someone who grew up with multi touch. So that's that's what I think is going to happen. I, I think you're exactly right, Andy, and I don't base it on any logic, but simply on the evidence from Apple at last week's education event where they're talking to. You know, young. This is what we want young people to use. They did not mention Macintosh at all. Yeah. Right. Uh, if it's, you yeah, look at where the money's going, where the R and D's going, where the heart and soul of Apple is going, in every case, yeah. follow the money. Well, it's and, iOS. This is this is, and I, I mean, think all this, Apple's doing at this point is trying to figure out what's what's keeping that from happening, and how do we solve it? And number one is development. Yeah. Yeah. And do they care about professionals? Maybe not. I mean. I, I know I, they did I the iMac that, Pro, but the Mac Pro is three years old. I I feel like I professionals, they're willing I, to cut off that group. I, All they, they really need to their, solve is how do we get people to develop for the uh, – for. I don't, I don't think I, – I think, I think it would break Apple's heart if the reference platform for developing iOS apps were a Windows machine. Uh, so I don't no, think, I agree. I, they if, need if, to if solve that. But that's where that all of their attention is focused right now. Is how, yeah. They're I mean, not saying, how do, what do we do with the Mac? They're saying, how do we get rid of the Mac? How do we solve the pain points of yeah. getting rid of the Mac? And, not, and one, and probably the only one, is how do we get development moved over? And there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, that don't necessarily require a desktop computing environment. All, 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 all I want to say quickly, I'll let the, everyone else get in, is that um, last week's education event was so significant. A, because I thought I think they have a wonderful plan for education. They really uh, they really landed all their points well. They really addressed the complaints that I've been hearing teachers making. But 
it's another example, just like the Apple Watch, of here is what Apple can accomplish when they are highly motivated and excited about succeeding in a certain space. This is how big they went, even though they, they their their strategy for the iPads and education more or less failed. They can they can fail as much as uh, any Apple product can. However, rather than leave the market and just sort of let it tail off, they decide, nope, we are going to listen. We're going to make an entirely new generation of, uh, of, uh, of software, of, uh, of lesson plans, of, uh, of social software, uh, a whole new uh, development system. We're also, going to, <laughs> we're also going to hold our nose, take a good shot of whiskey, and make a fantastic computer that costs $299 or $329. If they were as passionate about – I just feel like if they were as passionate about the Mac, they could have said, you know what? We're going to start making Macs that are really, really inexpensive because we are tired of – Kids not wanting to. We're tired of seeing kids with Windows machines. The, if they, like I agree I said, with you. If they how, believed that's, that's in desktop, they would counter the Chromebook with something like a Chromebook. They're well, not. They don't believe in the desktop. They believe in touch. They believe in iOS. That's the future. And in, and in ten years, we're going to be talking about how they're transitioning from the iPad to the AR. You know, like where it's all virtual and we're not and we're not touching any, any kind of screen. Ten happens. or fifteen years, we'll, <laughs> but we'll, we'll start seeing the transition. And, and I don't we're going to follow around start, when that happens. But I think that they're you know they're spending as much money on that as well. And I and I do I I think that the time the reality is as someone who is a power user who uses apps that would never run on an iPad right now. I mean, I can see that 80% of my time, though, is still spent in areas that I could use my iPad. Right. I, the interface isn't quite right. Well, the you're the disenfranchised there. group by this future that we're talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I, I think that, um, you know, I think that the, the big thing that Apple could, I, again, and I've said this before, that the, the kick in the teeth that Apple could do on the way out, you know, this is how you leave the house and burn it to the ground, is you get... <laughs> Once you get everybody over to the I iOS, you just open source Mac OS and and or or make it free, <laughs> and it would just it would just kind of like it would just kind of burn every like anything that was left behind them that would just kind of burn it all up. Like here you go, here you guys, you got you guys can have all of this. Um, or you know, reach the new world. You have yeah. button shut five. No, that's how you leave the house. I don't and burn think that's going to happen. I'll tell you what. I think that there's a couple of issues with that. First of all, there's uh, IP problems with releasing. It to open source that are probably in. I don't know about open source, but free. Like you just let you know. Let the other open, issue open is a bunch, a bunch of the, the security liability. As soon as a company says, "Okay, it's yours," but it, but they're now not doing security patches for it in this day and age. I think that's a real problem. I don't think I, I don't think they give. I I would love them to do this, right? But I think that they're they're just tactical issues that are going to keep them from doing it. They're going to bury I, uh, Mac OS. And it'll be bye-bye. And frankly, if I were a developer today and looking for a fertile territory that maybe in five years, I'd be starting to work on, a, on an operating system that could take over for those people. Who st I still think there's going to be a market for desktops. Renee, final thoughts that we're going to move on. Yeah, I think, you know, Ap Apple doesn't do everything. I think it, all of us would like Apple to do everything. Right. And Apple can't even do the stuff that they are doing now. Like right. you look, Andy's right about the education event, but as much as it was good, we also saw iBooks. We also saw pages take over for the languishing iBooks author. We saw the first update to iWorks in years, and they have two dedicated teams on that product. And you, you go back to the Mac, the Mac Mini. Apple is already doing so much that it can't it can't keep up with the stuff it's doing. So I, I think it's going to have to make a lot of hard choices. And they historically do not do things like netbooks, which would be analogous to low entry Chromebooks. They're they're going to want to do things that allow them to be as efficient as possible. And I think that is moving to be efficient as possible and to control the technology that allow them to create differentiated experiences. And I think this makes, when you look at where Intel is now and where PowerPC was then, I think uh, ARM Macs were a stick they hit Intel with for years, and now it's a blade they're just cutting loose with. Yeah. Uh, I think bingo, and I think the real disconnect here is there is what we as users want and hope for, <clears throat> and I think Apple's done exactly what you just described, Renee, which is said, we can't do everything. We don't, yeah. we don't need to be a computing company. We have a product that is killer. We're very happy. We're making, we're the one of the most valuable companies in history. We're doing fine. Let's just d double down on that. They have mentally cut loose something that we as users are very reluctant to cut loose. And from a business point of view, it makes perfect sense. From a global point of view, it's like, well, who's going to do Mac? But, but, but they, it also not like, issue. You know, they have a very, and I apologize for adding this on, but they have a very serious problem coming up. And that is like, our existing computer model, it's not going to be here forever. Right. And there are other companies that are really like, imagine like the iPhone 20 is a marble in your pocket that does local biometric authentication, cloud connectivity, and then takes over any AR or piece of glass screen opportunistically as needed. 
can Apple deliver that? I mean, they have so much work to do on Siri, on AI, on AR, that investing heavily in what will eventually be a product of the past makes less sense in Apple being Apple and working towards fixing all the things they need to to get to where the next hockey puck is going. Really great conversation. Thank you, everybody. We'll have more in just a bit. Our show today brought to you by the bad news that next week <laughs> your taxes are due. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna you, say I love my wife. Is it in Canada? Patriot's isn't it? Day. It's over in Canada, right, Renee? Or no? Um, it's 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 either April 30th or May 1st. Well, you get more time. We get less time. Yeah. It, so, but, but Leo, the taxes hurt more. So, <laughs> in, in uh, two weeks, your taxes will be done. That's the good news. It, the bad news is you have to do them in the next two weeks. That's why I want to tell you about TurboTax Live, the fastest, easiest, most accurate way to do your taxes. And now even more confidence that your taxes are correct because with TurboTax Live, you get a personal review of your tax return with a CPA or EA right on your screen. You can ask as many questions, get as many answers as you need. It's one-way video, so you don't even have to get out of your jammies to do this. It's the new way to get your maximum refund with a professional who works in the field right there on video on your computer you can even have the expert review your return before you file and make any necessary changes. And by the way, the questions you might want to ask, what about next tax time? What should I be doing now to prepare for a very new world with taxes? And they're up on the new tax law 100%. And of course, as with everything, everything TurboTax does, it's backed with a 100% accuracy guarantee. This is how I do my mom's taxes. I, I I wish I could do our business taxes this way because it costs us an awful <laughs> lot. Maybe we can now that we got a CPA or EA on the other side of the screen. Connect with a TurboTax Live expert today at TurboTaxLive.com slash MacBreak. This is, this is the last piece of the puzzle. TurboTax has always been the easiest, fastest way to do your taxes. And now you get the reassurance of an expert. It is fantastic. I will... You know what? My, my plan is, because I... I do my mom's taxes since last year. It's really easy in TurboTax because it imports everything from her uh, Schwab account and everything just automatically. So it makes it so, I mean, it really is 15 minutes to do the whole thing. But then the, what takes it a long time is mom, bless your soul, calls me and says, well, what about this? What about that? Did you think about this? What about that? And now I can just connect her with a TurboTax expert and say, mom, because she, she, she always says things like, I don't trust you. What does Lisa say? Because Lisa is an EA. Lisa knows all about this stuff. I don't, what does Lisa say? So now I'm just going to say, well, Mom, hey, here's the good news. we got TurboTax Live. Here's the uh, person. Just just talk to her. And I'm done. <laughs> TurboTaxLive.com slash MacBreak for real peace of mind. It's only two weeks oh, Nice off. of you, Leo. I know. She was paying 500 bucks every year. She's got the simplest taxes ever. Right. Uh, I mean, it's not. I can't do an easy with her. She's got some stuff that makes it a little bit more complicated, but it's so easy with TurboTax. Blah, 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 blah. Very good, son. Well, I felt, you know, I also took over investments. That's been it a little more challenging because every she watches, you know, cable news. And every oh. time, every time the market goes <laughs> down, cable news goes crazy. <laughs> and she says, sell my stocks. And I said, no, mom, no. You sell them when they're high, not low. Wait, it's going back up. And then they go back up and she's, oh, okay, you're right. And then sell my stocks. <laughs> ask Lisa if I should sell you my stocks. Ask Lisa. She really does. You she kinda, says ask Lisa. You kind of need to put a post-it next to the screen saying, do not buy gold or food buckets. <laughs> <laughs> Neither are important oh, or necessary. Yeah, exactly. She's 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 not quite to the point of burying gold in the backyard, but she's doing, by the way, she's doing great. Oh, uh, I'm glad you know, to hear it. Your, your, mom is, your mom is pretty damn adorable. She's wonderful. Isn't she a yeah. sweetie? Yeah. And she's, she, it's funny because uh, she acts like she's got no money. <laughs> and she's got a significant nest that's egg. Well, that generation. Video. That's the it's secret. The, it's the generation. That generation yeah. always thought it's about it. Totally that. the generation. She she says, "Well, like, I, you know, I've been buying her f food delivery Uber. You know, she says, "Well, I can't fix the plumbing. I don't have any money, so I pay for that." And then I see what she's got. It's like, "Mom, you should be giving me money." <laughs> no, no, no. I'm glad she has money. That's awesome. Um so my, you're telling me my iMac Pro is not going to be obsolete next year. No, no, I really. Tim Cook is not going to come to your house and take it away. Do you not love your iMac Pro, Renee? Do you not miss oh, it I now that it. you're on the road? You miss it, don't you? While people were walking by in the education event, I kept going iMac Book Pro, iMac Mac Book Pro. I'm too <laughs> used to it. I need to take it on the road now. I know, I know. I love my iMac Pro. I really do. 
Uh, has any? Have you tried? Do you own the new 2018 uh, fifth? What is it? Eighth generation? What generation iPad is it? Now? Sixth. Sixth generation. Uh, yes. We can't. My review went up yesterday morning. Tell me about it. Uh, it's really good. I mean, last year the argument was that it was the best tablet for the price, and that's sort of damning with faint praise because no other company has really done much in the in the pure you know pure play tablet. Uh, space uh, recently. Google's getting into it with Chrome. We'll see what happens, but it's it's a really good value. And what they've done is they've kept it essentially the same, but they've made two small and two large changes. One is the LTE is now twice as fast if you want that option. Also, the rose, the gold is kind of blushy, rosy, coppery gold <laughs> now, uh, which means that either you love it or you can't match your other gold products. So either way, but the two big changes: one is it's gone to the A10 processor. Uh, the A10 Fusion, and that has the high efficiency cores and the high performance cores, and it's about one and a half times faster. And especially on the low demand hardware that is the iPad, it just it just flies. It's silly, silly fast. And they've added Apple Pencil support, uh, so that now if you before, previously if you wanted to get uh, an Apple Pencil, you had to buy an iPad Pro. So so my takeaway from the review was you're literally getting half the Pro for just about half the price. You don't get the smart connector. You don't get the fancy display, you don't get, you know, a bunch of the bells and whistles, the four speaker system, but you get a really good entry level tablet with a really good pencil experience. And Logitech is going to make a crayon for education that has the same pencil technology, just no pressure sensitivity for 50 bucks and a very easy way for teachers to just throw them out there and not care who's pairing with which one. So one it's, complaint it's super interesting. Or, or one thing, not a complaint, but one thing people mentioned is that because the screen isn't, what is it, laminated like the iPad? It's not laminated. It's like the original iPad Air and it bothers me a lot but i gave it to like a bunch of my friends i gave it to my my god kids actually are in the video review talking about it they don't notice it drives me crazy but they so like, that's they so funny you online. can you can see it it makes my eyes bleed well no like i i, I can see it because i'm used to wake home and i'm used to air gaps and i'm right, used right. to like I, I can see the difference in glare but my mom for a long time went from an ipad 2 to an ipad pro and back and she was just like whichever one is charged at the time right and my god since in that video they're like which one is iPad Pro? Oh, I know. I know. Wait a minute. Is it this one? Is it that one? The resolution they, they is the same, the right? It's yeah, not, the screen size is a bit smaller. It's, it's it's that there's, you can, can you see a gap between the glass and the screen or what? It's a little bit more reflective. It's almost like the best analogy I can give is it's like old school cell animation where the paint is on the bottom of the glass rather than being inside the glass, see, which is what we're used to with animated you know, displays. It doesn't do anything for me either. <laughs> How about with the pencil? Uh, some people have said that, well, you said that when you see video of the pencil, you're going to see more lag, even though that's not what you see in real person. In real life. No, I mean, the, the pencil is the same pencil system as the 9.7-inch iPad Pro, and it feels about the same as drawing on the original iPad Pro. There is the air gap, which, you know, I, I, I used Wacom for years, and it had an air gap, and it right. didn't bother me until I started using the iPad Pro. And then I'm like, woohoo, no air gap, no ridicule, <laughs> not, ridicule not, not all of these things. So I don't like it as much, but, again, other people who aren't as fussy as me don't care. And it doesn't have a ProMotion display, so it doesn't ramp up to 120 hertz. So you don't get the absolute, like, close to zero latency but it's still it's as good as it's good as the ipad pro was before last june right which is remarkable for a 329 dollar tablet and you and most people wouldn't notice the difference probably no no, no i mean it kills uh, me that they, and, don't, that and they don't one benefit i fix it mentioned this and scooter x is reminding me in the chat room that it does mean you can separate the digitizer from the display and fix yeah. one or the other so it makes repair it actually improves repairability yeah and not laminating them uh you don't have to replace the whole thing at once so what did your uh, nephews think about the overall experience? They seem to be very happy in this video. They loved it. I mean, they have Chromebooks at school, and they were like, all of this is off the cuff. I didn't ask them to say anything. I told them to be as critical as they wanted. And they're like, oh, my God, my Chromebooks are so slow, and this thing just flies. Oh, when I draw on a nice. Chromebook, it takes like three seconds for the line. They exaggerate because they're kids. Like, it right. takes 10 seconds to boot up an app. It takes three seconds to draw a line. Uh, and they, they really liked it. And they loved the ability in iWork. Like they just go, wait a minute, you, you, can't, you don't just draw on it. You can draw like on top of your text and it stays anchored to your text. <laughs> and they started making all these stories like, immediately. I do they, like they that really feature. Like, that, that, yeah. that, that's really kind of cool. And you didn't yeah. know you were missing it until you got it. No. And then you went, oh. And it's like obvious in hindsight, right? Yeah. I never even thought of it. But if yeah, oh, when, that's cool. It goes with the I, annotation, when, goes with the text. Yeah. When so I, who I, should if, buy this iPad, uh, this new iPad? Who is this for? I mean, it's for people who've been waiting to upgrade from the iPad 2 or the iPad, you know, because that was a hugely popular tablet, the original iPad Airs. If you have an iPad Air 2, you, you might see the gap, the, the, the air gap. I don't know if it'll bother you not. Most people, it won't. Uh, if you've been really wanting an iPad Pro, like just to use Apple Pencil, but you didn't want to spend iPad Pro money, you get almost the same experience here for literally half the cash. 
I, I think that for ninety to ninety five percent of people who buy iPads, this is the right. <laughs> yeah, this is the right I one. Uh, there's a handful of people that want to push it a little harder, but I don't. I, I think that it's a very very small number. This is really the right, the right one for most people. Yeah, I agree. I I haven't had it, uh, as long as uh, as uh, as Renee has, but during the half hour, forty five minutes, I had one in my hands during the event. I was not paying attention to whatever I was being told to do. I was trying. I was <laughs> pinching and squeezing. I was. I was. I was. Uh, I was swishing uh, pictures all over the place. I was trying to get it to drop frames or in any way betray the fact that it is the least expensive computer that Apple makes. And none of that happened. It was a full. It was. It was the full boat experience. Uh, and uh, I. I will wish that Apple still made really good uh, iPad Minis because I love that form factor. But it is tiny enough for any 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 situation which you just don't you want a minimalist computer i really think anybody anybody who's been looking at a at a chromebook and thinking that gee that's really attractive it's a really nice computer well built a uh, good experience for just 300 dollars or so definitely should look at the ipad because it's not it's not it's not just this hardware and it's not just the ability to spend another 100 bucks and get an apple pencil although these are really big deals it's the fact that uh, ios still has the most impressive library of productivity and professional software for it one might even say that uh, outside of like Adobe Cloud and Microsoft Cloud, it really is the only machine that has a really impressive library of third-party productivity apps for it. It, of course, only comes with 32 gigs of storage. For a lot of people, that isn't going to be an issue. Uh, 429 if you want more storage. Yeah. It goes Really, there's only two choices, which is 32 and 128 <laughs> gigs. And then if you want cellular, add another $120 to that. So... Uh, for with cellular and 128 gigs of storage, you're talking 560 bucks. Which and an smart, Apple Pencil, you're talking 660. Yeah, yeah, and a smart keyboard. <laughs> you get well, you can't get the smart keyboard. You have to get like a Bluetooth <laughs> oh, keyboard. You have to get a Bluetooth. One. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, no smart connector. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, but I think you're right. I mean, every i if you get iPad Pro, it has the same kind of markup as you go higher up yep. the line too. Uh, that for most people. What did you say? Eighty percent, ninety percent. Most people, this is the right iPad, right? Yeah. Whether you decide would you, you need at five sixty or seven, or whatever it is, or or the th or the three twenty nine, depending on what you think you need. I think that this, obviously the three twenty nine is how how low can we go to make sure that uh, this folks who's, can get in. Who thirty two gigs is enough for people who just want to run apps, right? It's enough. My kids, my kids or who just play on their iPad would have been fine. Yeah. I mean, it, it. You need more if you're going to put your music collection on it, or you want to right. shoot and edit video. Even not not even so much anymore because a lot of that stuff is now near line where they it's keep streaming. the most frequently accessed and right. most recent stuff on the device and they offload everything else to the cloud and then just sync it back and forth. So I think it's unless you really want to keep a bunch of stuff on there all the time, like download stuff to watch offline and do those kinds of things. You can eat it up. Actually, but I think for most kids and most casually. That's a really fine. good point. Apple's been preparing for this low memory iPad for a while by having all of these optimization features and photos and right. And so that you don't really have to worry so much about how much storage you have. And let's be honest, 32 gigs is, a, is actually a ton of storage. It's just not. Yeah. Well, and, I, and I think that Apple, Apple is, Apple's <laughs> yeah. found that people either get the, the base model or they get they get the big model. They're not <laughs> they don't really do the whole in between thing. I, yeah. I, I'm sure that, that that's driven from um, experience on Apple. Yeah, side. Quick, we don't make a 64 gig because that's there's no market. for that. It. It's probably a very small percentage. I mean, I know I just get it's not funny because that. 64 <laughs> seems like the sweet spot, but you're right. I people always buy the, the highest. Right. So I think people some people buy either the, the littlest one that is cheapest or they buy the most yeah. biggest one because they're going to use it all the time, but they right. don't really – I bet you the middle parts don't get used very often. I, I'm actually wondering how much of the iPad Pro I have. When are we going to see a new iPad Pro? That's this fall? The earliest. Not yeah. June. No, right? it could be dub-dub. I mean, it could be dub -dub. Um, that's when they did it last year. But they don't do iPads every year. They do them every, between every year and every 18 months. I think lately. they did it the last two years in a row, didn't they? I mean, they had, because they, they did the 13-inch. No, 13 it was inch. a long time. I thought they did the 13-inch They did the 13-inch in September 2015, the 9.7-inch okay. in spring of 2016. Both of them got updated in the summer of 2017. And now our next window is summer 2018 or fall right. 2018. But so, that's supposed to be the bigger redesign. I don't know what I've got on here, but this is a 256 gig iPad Pro because, like you, I just mm -hmm. whatever's the best. Yeah. And then I've only I've I haven't used more. I have 144 gigs free. <laughs> so I think once I once I hit 256, I have now not not really had a lot of stress. You know about. about but I only have 300 have. songs on here, 300 videos. 
I don't know what's taking up all that my space. Pictures. You know what? I, 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 I find that takes up mine. Maybe. Uh, my, for, for me, it's comics, uh, the comicsology. <laughs> uh, actually, just, la just last week, when I couldn't put a movie I wanted to watch on a flight, I just decided I'm going to have to simply delete the comicsology app and reinstall it. And any comic or graphic novel that I can think of, I will reinstall. Uh, for, me, one, for me, 128 is the level at which if I exceed that, then that's a lack of self-discipline and I'm willing to invest in it. Uh, but 30, 32 is fine for if you're if you're willing to manage things a little bit. Yeah, I could have bought it's 128. Also, I haven't I've only used 111 on this one. So. It's also then, difficult now, Leo, because the they'll take advantage. They'll take advantage of space. So right. if they find there's free space on your device, they'll keep more of your photos locally and they'll keep more right. of your music locally and then ditch them again uh, when you need space. So it's like, it's hard to measure what you have on there as what you can actually put on there now. This I might have done just fine with 64, right? So Lightroom, yeah, oh, Lightroom has a bunch of 20 gigs of storage is used by Lightroom. Yeah. Uh, Audible, my Audible book, 16 gigs. Photos, 15 yeah. gigs. Yeah, yeah, and Netflix, 15 gigs. Yeah, but I wouldn't be using all that stuff. Uh, certainly the photos would be uh, offloaded. And yeah. iMessage can be big if your friends keep sending you all sorts of animated GIFs. <laughs> <laughs> My kids are obsessed. They get constant. Yeah. Uh, all right. All right. Thank you for the uh, the review, gentlemen. Um, and I do hope we can see a new... What will a new iPad Pro... It'll have uh, face recognition. It'll have... Yeah. S somewhat a eleven class processor, faster processor, yeah, yeah. I think it's time. I think it's time for a better camera too. Now that it's being looked at as an acquisition device, not just, uh, not just as a oh, is is wouldn't it be nice to be able to do chat and take pictures of fruit? I'm really. Did they go to two cameras on it? That'd be interesting. Like they do. Oh yeah, iPhone. why not? Why not make yeah. it as good as I'll the look, iPhone you know. ten? Why not? That'd be interesting. I also, I also wonder what what to, if you really wanted to throw a bone to the camera team. What if you told them that let's we will give you we, there's a lot more space inside the iPad Pro. We will give you the space that you keep asking for for the iPhones, but never get. Show really break our hearts with uh, uh, with the the best mobile camera hands down, even beating the the iPhone 10. I don't think that'll happen because people aren't clamoring for it, and the price is high enough as it is. But I would love to see what the camera group could do with as much space as they wanted uh, and as much battery as they wanted. I think I think it would be pretty amazing to see like a two-thirds inch chip with a with – a, uh, yeah. but not changing the resolution. You'd suddenly you have the, twice the photo sites. You have the room in you, here, you, It would you? just be – that would be insane. That would be kind you of you like also, that uh, add-on camera that, yeah. is, that you, you use. Yeah, yeah. it would be – You would also have – I'm sorry. Uh, given the size of the device, you'd also have room for one really wonderful separation for oh, yeah. 3D scanning. Yes. Yep. So as opposed to kind of kind of getting it right, well, just being able to capture stuff from the desktop, it's like I, I've, I would love to be able to just randomly <laughs> say, I want I want a 3D model of this because I want to use because I'm doing something professionally or just because I want it. Um, tip of the hat to Lucy Bellwood. I just got I, I, this is from a Kickstarter project that I'm so happy I paid for. Uh, but it's but it would also allow people to just explore 3D modeling uh, and VR and AR in ways that it's a stumbling block if they don't have the ability to create their own 3D models very easily and do capture. Well, and I think that also even if you even if you just set the the distance so that it was the same as the interocular distance is the same as the human eye, you could take some great stereo pictures and you know have yeah. your, you know, wow. your have there your really little, is a lot you know of there's a you know that would be. How much, so much how much room is there in a ten and a half inch iPad? There seems like there's enough. It's room mostly to... speaker now, so they because yeah. you can't put too much lithium ion on it. You're not allowed flying or right. shipping it, and that's a big drag. So they put it the big speaker system in there. In other words, they got a lot of space in there. That'd be kind of say cool. go for it. Yeah, go for it. I'm I'm so close to being able to just take. Um, we're going to Japan for two weeks. Mm -hmm. I can almost take just my iPad. I would love to just take my iPad. I think about it. I think, I think about it too. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, I wanna. Yeah, because for me, a lot of it's security too. When I'm traveling, I feel much more secure with my iPad than I, you know, like it's easier the, to wipe the off. The only thing, and I really probably don't even, would be to bring. Well, there's two things, and one is completely, you know, idiosyncratic. Has nothing to do with any normal person. But the, I just I have a programming book I'm working on, and I'd like to have my programming language, which is not available yeah. on the iPad. Mm -hmm. So that's not. But it's photos. It's photography, and I could. I'm going to bring a Sony A9. I could easily use the Sony software to put the, you know, the the JPEGs of it. The RAWs would have to stay on my. Uh, There's camera. a way to read that in, isn't there? You can read, read the RAWs. Uh, yeah, I, but I think you don't. I mean, 
I guess I have enough storage. I probably yeah. could. Why not? Just copy them over. The, that main reason I do copy them over is for more for backup than because I want right, to edit right, right. those images. I won't edit those till I get home. Uh, but with Lightroom, I could actually do a lot of triage on mm -hmm. the iPad. Yep. Pick the pictures yep. I want to save. Do some basic edits. Those get copied to the desktop. And then when I get the raw file on the desktop, those modifications would apply immediately to the raw file. Yep. So. Uh, maybe you know what, maybe should I should I be a guinea pig for oh, this trip and just I don't take know I don't know hand? if I get to do it I think I, I'll, there'll be a lot of Alex said to do this then the next thing stuck. is not to bring my Sony at all but take all the pictures with the iPad I have uh, the DXO one no. uh, <laughs> what you do is you give the laptop and the camera Lisa, to Lisa and then she holds them I, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah tie me to the mast Lisa well, no matter what I say don't <laughs> well, see, give me the, the camera or the iPhone or the uh, <laughs> Well, actually, actually, you know, I, I I take that back because you are not. If you do not get into an Instagram fight for good photos with Lisa, Lisa will She'll win. Yes. So you, I don't. So you may to, as well yeah. say that you may as well say, oh, I've all I have is the this mobile device. I don't have the really lovely professional equipment that Lisa is armed with. <laughs> there, that gives me a good excuse. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. But I, the, the only thing the only thing I keep wanting to remind people is that phone cameras are really really great. All cameras are all these cameras are wonderful on Instagram. It's when you actually have them blown up on a screen that you can actually see yeah. people's eyes. You realize that oh, this real yeah. camera took a much better photo, yeah. even though it's just a four hundred dollar pocket camera. So yeah, the, think about that when you're attending when you're attending the first viewing of your brand new grandchild. Uh, the, maybe you do want to have a good camera. The good news is you're going to Japan, which means that if you find that you needed that camera, Yodabashi <laughs> camera, Yodabashi camera is on is on the is it the Chibu line? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it, you'll you'll you're, you'll very, be you're tempting me now. See, you you can you can all and you'll find cameras there that that, that don't exist you, that don't exist here. You know, like you'll be like, oh, that's amazing. You know, it, <laughs> you know, it takes a picture of me while I'm taking a picture of it, and it takes it takes three other pictures from from four feet away. You know, it's, it's I am it's, gonna bring I'm gonna bring a Pixel two XL and I'll have an iPhone ten. Yeah, see, I, I, I have it's just an opportunity to go research. Akihabara. That's a big, that's a <laughs> big saying. leap. No, I think I don't know. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. It's it felt good on uh, when I went to the Caribbean. I did not bring uh, a computer, and I didn't need anything more than the iPad Pro. Right. Yeah. I I have to admit, I think about like I plan a shoot if I'm taking my SLR now. Um, ninety, I would say ninety nine percent of the photos I take now are all my iPhone. Have you noticed how fresh the air is in our studio these days? It smells so nice. I can smell, I can it, smell it even across the internet. <laughs> like early morning dew we, on a golf course. We used to have a problem in here um, with paint smells. Remember the fires in Sonoma County? It was smoky yeah. in here. We could barely work in here. Now we have a molecule in here. I've, I feel like, <laughs> go ahead, tar the roof. Go ahead. We won't even notice it because we have the world's best air purifier. Molecule is the world's first molecular air purifier for you know the hepa filter technology you probably think is a good air purifier was invented in the 40s and there really hadn't been any improvements since then it was just a filter and it and it couldn't filter stuff uh, too small you wouldn't get any air through it molecule uses photoelectrochemical oxidation or pico to go beyond the hepa filter to capture and eliminate the tiny particles a HEPA filter doesn't even know about. Allergens, mold, bacteria, viruses, even airborne chemicals like VOCs from paint. All of them, pollutants up to a thousand times smaller than those a HEPA filter can catch. So uh, we we got it, first got it uh, for at home because Lisa was getting headaches and stuffed up nose every morning. And we realized, yeah, yeah we're living in the country. It's allergies. She has not had a headache. In fact, the one time we were out of town and uh, her nephew stayed in our bedroom and turned off the, for some reason, I don't know why, turned off the molecule. The next day when we came home, she had a headache the next morning. She said, I don't know what's going on. Oh, the molecule's been off. That was a blind test that really proved it to me. Molecule makes it easier to cope with asthma and allergies, significantly reduces systems. Since then, we bought one for the studio and one for our Michael's room. One customer reportedly said after using molecules, she was able to breathe through her nose for the first time in 15 years. And this is technology, the real technology, not some imagined. This is funded by the EPA, extensively tested, not only by real people like me and Lisa, but, but university laboratories like the University of South Florida's Center for Biological Defense. 
the University of Minnesota's Particle Calibration Laboratory. This really works. Easy to use, has a clean, sleek design. Looks good. It's kind of the apple of air purifiers, that aluminum unibody shell. And one of the things you can do, you don't have to, you can operate it from the top. It's got buttons. But if you pair it to your phone, you can operate it over the Internet as well as at home from your phone via Wi-Fi. And one reason you might want to do that is because then you can get filters sent to you. It knows and they send you filters when you need them, when it's start, starting to run low. We only have changed the filters once in about eight months. So it's not a whole lot, but it's still nice to get that filter subscription service. You can connect Molecule to the Wi-Fi, control it remotely. You can, uh, you can turn off Bluetooth and Wi-Fi as well. So you get the choice. For $75 off your first order, go to M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E, -E, Molecule with a K.com, and use our promo code MACBREAK. Molecule, let me, t I just, all I can say is it's worth it. It works. It really excuse me, really, really works to the point where if we don't have it on, we really notice it. M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E dot -E com. Molecule. Use the promo code MACBREAK. Give yourself a treat. Get a molecule and breathe free. You know, you know what you should do, since you have such a great, great filtering system, you should allow employees to microwave fish in the staff microwave. <laughs> I, I bet I bet it could ha I bet it could handle it. You know, what? actually, that does remind me I should get a molecule for my office because I am for some reason I am my guess my air system is next to the microwave. <laughs> so no matter <laughs> no matter what is cooking in the kitchen, it goes, it's like they're pumping the air into my office. Not here. I don't ever try and again. <laughs> yeah. Try tripe again. Yeah. Uh, all right. We got iOS 11.3. Uh, okay. As far as I can tell, there's two things. I know there's more, but there's new Animoji. There's like four Animoji. New Animoji. There's a bear. Down, there's a lion. <laughs> I missed. There's a uh, like dragon, dragon, which is perfect for Chinese New Year. And there's a scary skull. Um, but if I don't you use Instagram, you can see uh, a preview there. Oh. Uh, I don't use the uh, item emoji at all, so I don't. <sighs> there's the dragon. I do yeah. like the lion because the lion is me. So. In the jungle, the, the lion. mighty jungle, the lion sleeps to die. What they're also great for is that you can just, like, you don't have to do a bunch of talking stuff. You can just make really weird facial expressions and use those as responses to messages. Like if someone says something outlandish, oh, you I can gotta just try that. I do that all the time. That's that's actually what yeah. I do. I do that more than anything else. So you just have to be careful of what the uh, background noise background is. is the noise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very confusing because like you're that. in the that's background now, so I gotta I gotta do it in silence. All right, so that's that's one new thing. The other one, one we've been expecting and and waiting for, and uh, are glad to get the new battery information. And this doesn't matter to me. I'm on a new uh, iPhone, so it says my battery health is 100 percent perfect uh, because it's relatively new. But if you have an older phone, it will now tell you what your maximum capacity is, and for the first time, give you a switch to disable that peak performance reducer it'll also it'll actually it'll autom it'll turn it off right away as soon as you download 11.3 it'll turn off any performance throttling that's already been applied to your phone it'll really? give you a clean slate oh it turns yeah, it off immediately oh turns it off and then it'll only turn it back on if you have another unexpected shutdown at which point you can manually turn it off again you really shouldn't do that because it's like yanking an sd card out of your computer while it's reading and writing I mean, one, like most of the time, it won't do any problems. Sometimes you'll never be able to use that SD card again. Right. So, like, it's just these things are not designed for unexpected shutdowns. So, you shouldn't be turning it off, but you can. And it'll also tell you to go and have it serviced uh, if you need so it. So, by default, if you have an, if you have had that uh, slowdown turned on, yeah. iOS eleven point three will turn it off until yes. you have one bad experience, and then it'll turn it on again. Yeah. And then you can turn it off again, but it'll keep turning on every time you get an unexpected shutdown. That's it. it. So the default is to have it turned off. I think that's actually a good response from Apple. So you're going to get maximum performance until such time as you show that you 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 can't handle the performance. I mean, it's it's a dangerous call because if your phone shuts down again, it could it could damage the the memory on your phone and the content that you have on your phone. It could also leave you without a phone in a really bad situation. But when you don't. When you don't let give people the choice, they don't really like. They think you're just screwing them. You're just making their life painful for no reason. Right. So it, it, it's a tough call. So those are two big things, but uh, but people are saying eleven three is a big update. So what else? 
I don't know. If, I, I don't consider it a big update. I think it's a, it's a typical spring update, and okay. the animoji is like the headline feature because that's what gets people to download. There is a There's new a lot business of things behind the scenes. Business chat yeah. in the iMessage. I haven't experienced it yet. This is this is for businesses to chat with you. Yep. Uh, so you, you and it's anonymous. It's in the Apple tradition, it's encrypted and anonymous, and they don't give your your information to the vendor. It's just a way for them to have a one on one conversation with you inside the app that you'd probably be using anyway. So right now it works with Apple, Discover Cards, Hilton, The Home Depot, Lowe's, Marriott International, Newegg, TD Ameritrade, Wells Fargo, and 1-800-Flowers. I do take that back, though, because ARKit 1.5 is in here, and that's a pretty big update because instead of just having horizontal surfaces, it now does vertical uh, and, oh. and non non-standardized services too and they have some amazing apps like apps that put museum like paintings on the wall and you can go up and look at them and walk around them and it understands all the vertical surfaces for the models and that's we got to see a couple of museum apps at the show and that those are really well done good actually one thing that the business chat does add which i'm all for is more i hope more businesses will start using apple pay because that is a yeah. great experience buying stuff online or on the phone i really like that so the Wall Street Journal was horribly annoyed that you get a notification if you haven't set up Apple Pay that they thought you couldn't turn off. But you, you, if you see a notification, just tap on it and then hit cancel and it will go away. And you'll never see it again. No. Okay. Um, all right. And so it, what app, you, what was the name of that painting app? Do you, ha do you know that? Because I would, I would oh, like I to try the... Call off it was a museum app. I'll have to look okay. it up. Okay, we'll find it. So I would like to see... You know some of the the new it stuff. It was great because it was a painting that had a lot of smaller paintings, and you could blow up the smaller paintings to look at the paintings within the paintings, That's and cool. walk around and peer at it closer than any museum guard would allow you to do in real life. You can sort uh, reviews in the App Store by most helpful, most favorable, most critical, or most recent. That is a big help. Yeah. I, I do that on Amazon. That really is a good way to you know get rid of the junk reviews and find the best reviews. So that's that's good. AR Kit 1.5, we mentioned that. Uh, iPad charge management. Hey, speaking of charges, where the hell's that pad they were going to re <laughs> <gonna release? laughs> release? Yeah. Uh, Awkward. <laughs> doo -doo 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 -doo. It'll, it'll end up in a press release you know, at some point when they're ready. Um, I, think I know when I installed... Too, it got too warm and kitty cats wound up sleeping on your nightstand on top of it. I know when I installed iOS 11.3, I got a... Uh, and also the new uh, Mac OS I got this too, I think. The new privacy uh, yeah. warning. And Megan, uh, let me see if I can find Megan's uh, tweet about this. She said it'd make a nice cake topper for any, if <laughs> anybody who uh, who uh, is interested. Uh, it's, um, it's a dark person shaking hands with a light person. But I think uh, it's not race they're talking about. It's, uh, it's somebody whose privacy is, here it is. If you're getting married soon, says Megan, I encourage you to get a cake topper made of these two Apple privacy people. <laughs> so, well, what? you know, I'm, I'm taking back what I said about not being a big update because it also includes like the, the GDPR, which is the general, uh, the general data protection regulation in the EU is coming out. And Apple is using that to sort of start. They're going to start pushing this stuff out in the EU first because it kicks in May 25th. But it's going to go globally and right. it's going to do things like. You'll be able to like any Apple app will give you that icon and ask your permission before it uses any app for Apple's purposes. And then it will minimize any data collection. It'll give you transparent controls. It'll process on the device instead of in the cloud whenever possible. And it'll use encryption for everything that it possibly can. And they're going to give you some new services like most of the services you could do already, but they were scattered around different places. So you can get a copy of any data that Apple has. You can you can request a correction to data if something is inaccurate. You can deactivate your account and you can delete your account. And it's all going to be super easy to get to. And they're going to update all of that on apple.com slash privacy. You know, this whole issue with privacy is really playing directly into Apple's Oh, hands. it's so good for them. Tim Cook knows it too. When he uh, he was interviewed by Chris Hayes and uh, Kara Swisher for a, yeah. a, a, a table round table that they're going to have uh, air on MSNBC uh, April 6th. And uh, he... They, uh, when they asked him about the Facebook controversy and what he, what Tim Cook would do if he were in Facebook's shoes, he said, "I wouldn't be in this situation," <laughs> and, the, and the crowd goes crazy. Uh, so yeah, this is Apple's story plays right in Apple's story, and, and not a story that's new, a story that they've had for ten years. Yeah, you know, it's it's definitely the direct. You know, yeah. they're in the well, right place at the right time after ten years. Where like there was a conflation that companies were telling or companies were telling us that we were choosing to believe that them providing deep personal knowledge of us was synonymous with them then using that knowledge to power 
uh, advertising or marketing programs. And they're, they're two separate things. You can like it's expensive to do, but you can acquire deeply personal data and use it just for the user and just on device. It, if you have some other way to subsidize it, if you don't, then it becomes the advertising model, and that's sort of, sort of the disconnect. And Apple is saying, "We're since we're not using advertising, we're just charging you nice margins, and all the products you buy, we'll do this sort of stuff, and we won't we won't also be uh, using advertising or marketing on your and, data." And, and I think Zuckerberg's uh, point was good that he said, "Well, you can't do that for you know if you want to make it available to everybody at all prices, um, you have to find other ways of monetizing it." And he, you know, and I, I don't know what the I don't know what the answer is to that. You know how you make also, sure it's available to everyone. Yeah. Also, I, I, although this, this, I agree with everything that Tim is saying there. I think that's a very strong card for Apple to play, and I think that they're they should continue to play it. Every time that Tim makes this sort of strong statements against Google and Facebook, I really want to ask the follow up question. Yeah, but you don't really seem to care about privacy and security for your users when their users subject to a government that wants to use iPhones to keep them under the government's thumb a little bit tighter. I really, I, I think that it's going to, it continues to become more and more important that app that uh, Tim throw into the mix, ideally when he's not actually speaking at a conference in China supported by the government, uh, that he at least nods to where that, that nods to the fact that there is a line that Apple will not cross, that they will, of course, they're forced to comply with uh, local laws and regulations regarding the user user content, what people can do with their phones. But nonetheless, th if there is a line that they are not going to willing to cross with just any government, no matter how big the market is, I really, really, really need him to make a statement like that. I have to say Mark Zuckerberg was obviously a little needled by Tim <laughs> Cook's statement calling his criticism extremely glib. It's easy for you, Tim. You put yourself in my shoes. I can't um, tell if that was smart or not, because on the smart side, it, it changes the topic of conversation and makes it about Apple as much as Facebook, and that right. might be a good distraction. But on the other side, he's busy doing the equivalent of the drunken druggie celebrity going on Oprah and being all contrite and crying, and it sort of ruins it when you right. turn around and start needling Apple. I, so I, I don't know if that was And I think it's not. the true mark coming out. But I also agree with his point. Uh, you know, there's there's that uh, cliche that, uh, you know, if 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 that you're the product, right? Mm -hmm. What is it if... If, uh, if, you're not, if you're not paying for it. If you're not paying product. for it, you're the yeah. product. He says, you know, I find that argument, if you're not paying, that somehow we don't care about you to be extremely glib. This is uh, Zuckerberg. And not at all aligned with the truth... And as you pointed out, if you want to build a service that connects everyone, then there are a lot of people who can't afford to pay. We don't charge for our podcasts. We sell advertising against the podcast. We don't collect information on you. Well, we do the yearly survey, but that's completely voluntary. Um, but we can get away with that because we're a niche service. And by the virtue of what we content we put out, we, you know, advertisers know who they're getting. They're getting tech enthusiasts geeks and if they want mac enthusiasts they listen they advertise on mac break weekly if they want windows enthusiasts they have and so that works well you're for us incredible. but not everybody can do that choosy. facebook can't do that you're incredibly choosy about your advertisers and you put your audience first and you're arguing against facebook well, and we don't have automated have advertising either right well, yeah. and the argument against facebook is that they have often made decisions that were for the better of their bottom line and their their advertising customers rather than their their users right well, yeah I, 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 I every, also time, think, every time I go ahead. every time I talk to Facebook, I I am taken by the impression that uh, I don't think they're evil, but they really don't think that the privacy of their users are important. If they if they believe that they're doing good with the work that they're doing in Facebook, they believe that by by making it so easy for people to share information about themselves, they are uniting the planet, which is a very limited point of view. Uh, so, uh, whereas when I talk to Google engineers, uh, no one is under any uh, misconceptions that uh, so much of the company's money is made through advertising, targeted advertising. But I also get the impression that, again, there's the line that they will not cross. They still believe that there is it's possible to have that business model without thinking of your uh, uh, of your users as sheep that at best in the best of times need to be sheared of their wool, in the worst <laughs> of their times need to be slaughtered for meat. Well, he I, did. He did uh, a, a little uh, sharp elbow to Apple. Zuckerberg uh, quoted Jeff Bezos an old saying. He said, "There are companies that work hard to charge you more, aka Apple, and there are companies that work hard to charge you uh, less." He says it's important we don't all get Stockholm syndrome and let the companies that work hard to charge you more convince you 
that they actually care more about you because that sounds ridiculous to me. That's that's a shot right at Apple. Yeah, and there I, was a good retort to that though, where Amazon's as Amazon has a direct customer relationship the way Apple does, and Facebook their direct customer relationship is not with the people who are using their app. Right. So they charging you less yeah. is they, his, he's not charging you anything. You're not a customer. Well, so that I, goes like right back to the original argument. That's a good point. Yeah. And, and when I think the people what. what what also people, I think they underestimate with this whole process of what they get for free, whether it's Google or Facebook, the amount of money it takes to do what they do. Like when you think about the fact that you can upload a video to oh, YouTube amazing. and millions of people are going to watch yeah, it. Right, you're yeah. not going to pay. I had to used to, I used to have to pay for that per gig. Yeah. You know, we used to make things out of flash and I got really good at compression because I had to figure out a way to get every, every ounce because I was, I was paying all that money. And, and so the idea that you can put up a 4K image, a 4K video, and that's all done for free. You know, it's not free for everybody. I mean, it's not someone's paying for that. You know, and and that infrastructure that we get out of that, I think that when we have these conversations and we can theoretically talk about that, I think we underestimate the value that yep. we are getting out of this relationship. You know, and and I do think that we as personally need to be very careful about what we put online. You know, like I think that that's you know, it's there not. There is yeah. This in every case, there never is any talk about what the responsibility of the user is. It's always the company's responsibility. And frankly, if you don't share this stuff with Facebook, it doesn't know it. I've just quit Facebook. That was my way of... I don't, yeah. I don't quit no, Facebook. That's, but I think that's, that's very true. But also, Facebook does a really good job of making it... Un, not, oh, they of trick Helping you, you not, under, oh, yeah. not understand exactly oh, yeah. what, you're, you. what you're exactly sharing. Uh, I think Google... Uh, it's there if you're looking for it. But even there... People have to learn that there is there is this this is the nature of the transaction. That uh, again, I do think that uh, Google does it right the uh, the best way that this sort of thing can be done. But even so, even if they're going to give people these great tools, people have to be educated that these tools exist and that there is a way to remove searches from their history and way to remove uh, location tracking from their histories. So, well, thanks to GDPR, every company is going to have a way to do that now. And I think yeah. really we should thank the EU for giving us at least giving us a choice and you know and, and as i look at where where i'm you know i'm already with my kids getting to the age where they're going to start posting things at, at some point you know i'm really in the in the you training have to think about it you i'm in the training them. process yeah. of you are building from the day you put make your first post you are building a portfolio that people are going to look at and they're not and you're not going to maybe you can erase it maybe you should but you're nuts to think that you can furthermore if you don't <laughs> do that somebody else will build that portfolio for you so mm -hmm. actually i always tell teenagers this you should be creating a portfolio. You should be creating an online persona, right. but make sure it's positive, right? <laughs> because and if you don't, then you, it's really a problem. You you know you, you have no reputation online. Somebody may make a reputation for you. And and it, and, and when you're in a freshman in high school, they sh there should be a class that is an entire I term agree. that is going to teach you you know what you should be thinking about when you're talking about social. And it should be more a, than ever a required class of understanding because you're setting your whole life up. Those those pictures are not coming back. You know, like, I, you, I know we can talk about it, but, you know, there's no guarantee. You should not be sending the kind of pictures that teenagers send to each and other. GDPR you, you know, not, all that stuff. You've lost yeah. control of that stuff. Yeah, it's never, that, that's never going to be enough to, to protect you. You right. should be protecting yourself to some degree. Um, you know, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be regulation. I'm just saying that as, a, as an individual, you should also, you know, I get that people are supposed to stop at the, at the, at the uh, stop sign, but you still should look both ways before you cross the street. Bingo. Let's take a break. Then your picks of the week, folks. Get ready. Uh, but right now, I'm going to pick some wine. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not listening to this too early in the day because <laughs> it's time <laughs> for wine. It's 5 o'clock somewhere. Where's the glasses? <laughs> I, I don't understand. We that. had glasses out on uh, <sighs> Twit yesterday. I see how it is. And it was funny because I had two teetotalers on the show with me, and Andy was remote. Thank you, by the way, for being on the uh, Twit show on oh, Sunday. Oh, I, I, I loved it. I Hope to get hope we get to do it more. It's nice to, it's nice to have Anytime. a reason to be in on Sunday night. It was great to have you on. And we talked a little bit about Wink. And if I could have shared some of this Wink with you, I would have, Andy, because it was I was drinking a Wink Pinot that was I, it so was, good. It, it was it was you, you described it so well that yes, I did crack out my bottle of port and oh, good. had my had myself a tipple after. Oh good. Yes. I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah. Uh Wink is well, I guess it's uh, maybe it's short for Wine Club, I guess, W-I-N-C. It is uh, a monthly wine shipment to you based on your taste. In fact, when you go right now to trywink.com slash MacBreak, you'll go through the taste test. How do you like your coffee? Strong and black? Uh, how do you like, how do you feel about salt? Uh, I don't need it or I love it. Uh, citrus, they ask you about 
umami, mushrooms, truffles. They ask you about berries. So they And then peppers. They get a profile of your tastes. And then you get to build your first box. You can choose how many reds and how many whites. It could be all red, all white, or anything in between. And you get your first box of Wink wines. Now, Wink is a winemaker. This is very important. This is not leftovers from some other winemakers. Wink, in fact, I met Wink's winemaker, and I was so inspired. We had a little tasting down at the Wink headquarters uh, a couple of weeks ago. This is my favorite one. This is the one we, uh, we had. This is called Field Theory. Field Theory is one of their uh, labels. And this one is a Blaufrankisch, which is a German-style wine. They also have a white Field Theory that's an Albarino, an Italian-style wine. These grapes, uh, it says, curious varietals from unfamiliar places. These grapes are from Paso Robles, but they're picked at midnight. They're picked in the dark. They don't pick them in the daytime. They're hand-picked, de-stemmed, fermented whole berry, Aged eight months in uh, neutral uh, French oak. It, it this is what my new favorite wine. But you don't have to you don't have to do what I do. You might prefer a little white Sauvignon Blanc from Santa Barbara County. They have French wines. They have uh, Argentinian wines. We had a wonderful Malbec there. They have beautiful labels, artist designed labels. This is a really interesting company. Here's a Central Coast Pinot. I haven't tried this one called. Folly of the Beast. Don't you love that? Mm. One of the things you like about this is, so it's four bottles a month, which is just about right for like one or two meals a week maybe or even a meal a week and then a bottle to bring to friends. I would bring this to friends because it would be so fun. It's got the whale tail on it, Folly of the Beast. And the thing is you can do that with confidence because even though these are affordable wines, they're always really, really good. People love Wink Wines. In fact, as we get into warmer weather, the insanely popular Summer Water Rosé is a bestseller and one you absolutely have to try. Look at the funk zone. I love that label. Uh, this way, you get to introduce to new varietals, new styles. They work directly with winemakers and growers from all over the world to make all of their own wine. Again, they are a winemaker. No membership fees. You can skip any month. You can cancel any time. Shipping is covered. And by the way... There's really no obligation because if you try something, you go, oh, this is not what I hoped for. I don't like it. They just send you another bottle with of, of something you love. Do do me a favor. Try the field theory, either the Albarino or the whatever that is, the Blanc Stamfersnawana. It's really, really, really good. Why settle for the same bottle of wine you always get when you can discover new wines, great wines, today? Oh, just try it, please. Do me a favor. Try wink.com slash MacBreak. $20 off your first shipment. T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com slash MacBreak. You can buy wines there a la carte as well. And use the uh, special URL there so you get that $20 off. Try Wink. T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com slash MacBreak. Breaking news? Oh, dear. Yeah. Uh, possible shooting at YouTube headquarters. It's just coming in. Um, let me take a look at this. Um, this is from... Uh, You've got this. You've got it in front of you, Alex. Uh, this is well. Yeah, it, it, no one knows right now what's happening, but it looks like within the last couple of minutes, there's a lot of police action right now, uh, right outside the YouTube head, headquarters. Oh <sighs> golly! Uh, possible active shooter reported at the San Bruno headquarters. That's not the main headquarters. No, that is for YouTube. It is. Oh, for YouTube, it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. That's uh, terrible. Uh, all we see is police activity. Let's hope it's uh, let's hope it's a false alarm. All right, moving on. I'm going to do this one because if I don't do it, I know Alex will steal it. But I think Alex will want to know about this. There is a, a group of uh, people called Wonder Unit. Have you ever heard of Wonder Unit? I have not. They um, are they they're creators. They make film, and they are offering a free storyboarding app oh, for Mac. Like Windows and Linux called Storyboarder, and it's free, free. There's no ads in it. There's no come on. They said, we developed it for ourselves, and we liked it so much, we thought we'd just make one for you. Now, it's more than just filmmakers. I mean, anybody who has to kind of plan a sequential story, um, you, can, you can print and import the paper. So if you draw on paper, but you can't draw on an, on an iPad, you can do that. You can export it to Premiere, Final Cut, Avid, PDF, or Animated GIF. So 
it's really kind of completely open in terms of of what it can output to if you're if you're built if you build i use uh, storyboard apps a lot to build presentations so yes, that's how i perfect. that's how i'm thinking through them and yes. trying to figure out what i want to do it's just way faster for me to sketch them all out then i take that and i open it up in keynote and then i actually build everything and it's like 10 times faster than trying to think about it in keynote you get too caught up in like where this pixel is and if you're not a good drawer like i am <laughs> you can generate shots by typing female medium over the shoulder and it will put in models that you can then change and customize so you can you can actually do your own storyboarding by typing i love this feature it's called sketch sprint they give you 20 minutes to do a sketch sprint at the end of the sprint they create an animated time lapse gif of your work isn't that awesome and it's free i just this blew me away when i saw it uh i i don't i didn't even really get it i kind of thought what how why they answer the question <laughs> in an interesting way and there's some profanity here which i won't say out loud but if you're reading just close your eyes if you don't like profanity storyboarder is niche software the market is tiny there's an inverse relationship between the market size and price we have to charge to make money we're building this tool for ourselves to make better movies we make money making movies not making software we believe creative software should be free let's be completely real I've never known anyone working on dope-ass stuff to be paying for the software they use anyway. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> but you pay for your software. Storyboard Pro. Crappy software that costs a 1000 bucks. Boards, another online software that just allows you to order images and cost a monthly fee. F those guys. <laughs> and then in little fine print, and I'm not really sure what the genesis of this is, and F Sony Pictures, they make the worst effing movies. What does that have to do with free software? Not much. Maybe use free software to make great movies and don't waste money going to a Sony movie. And then, for some reason, F Dave Morin and Gary Vaynerchuk. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if you give away really amazing software completely for free, you get to say things like that I, at the end. I have a feeling that they are... Uh, there's a story bitter. there. They're bitter there. There's, some, there's some bitterness. Yeah, like, like, there's, there's something. A, Wonder they, they unit. They probably make dark movies. It's also open source on GitHub, which I even like more. So I uh, wonder, I, I don't know why this is free. I, I mean, even if you don't do storyboarding, get it just for places to put ideas because it's free. Wonderunit.com slash storyboard. And if you want to see more, a lot of times when people make something for free like this, they're thinking about something better that's on the other end of this. That they might. So your job is to go download it for free because it tells them, hey, there's, yeah. some, there's an interest. There's a market. There, there people want to do it. So if, if you're at all interested at all. I noticed all, you just downloaded it and installed it. So that's yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'd be curious what you think. I mean, you know, probably your paid tool is better in some obscure way, but I don't. I don't know. This looks pretty good. I mean, I, I wouldn't I wish buy a storyboarding program because I don't make movies. I have but to I admit that I just wish it was on an iPad. I know this belongs. Like on when an I iPad. look at it, I thought when I first saw the interface, I was like, "Oh, this oh, would be great yeah. on an iPad." It's got um, it's got drawing tools and all. I know that it's stuff. got drawing yeah, tools. It's Windows, Mac, and Linux. That's, a, that's the only thing I'm bummed about. What do you got so good, Mister Alex Lindsay of the Pixel Core? What's your pick of the week? I'm working on another video that's going to be kind of a follow-up to some of the stuff I've been doing. <laughs> I really and like those video series. What's it called? Wait, the, Trash the talking? Teardown. No, the, the teardown. teardown. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm, what happened was I started doing the teardown, and then people started asking me to do, well, how would you fix it? So I'm starting to work on that. And so I'm going to talk about green screen. And uh, and one of the things I wanted to, as a ch to challenge myself is can I pull a good green screen with a iPhone? You know, like, you know, just shoot an iPhone with some relatively cheap equipment, and Can one of you? the things I knew that, well, I'm going to find out. I haven't done it yet. I, okay. So I, but I was starting well, to, that'd be cool. I was starting to think through this process and I was like, I really need to use Adam, Adam Wilt's uh, centimeter because that's how I even up my green screens. And so I'm going to show how to use it um, in the future. But when I got back into it, I didn't, I didn't have centimeter two loaded in and I was like, this is great. So if you are, um, if you're doing anything that you really need to understand what's in front of you, uh, Centimeter is a great way to, for you to measure, actually measure what the camera is getting. And, you know, you can, um, a lot of it is when you're dealing with lighting or if you're dealing with a green screen, um, you, this is a key little operation um, that you can do. Now, of course, this isn't your camera, your actual camera that you're using. Um, although I do believe it actually can interface to some degree. But, but now this the, looks like it has some hardware that goes on top of the phone. No, is you, that right? you can, it'll use a Lux um, thing that goes on top. Uh, that's a little... That would be more accurate, right? Uh, for certain light measurements. I've always wondered um, how you know, well a camera phone can do that kind of light metering. Well, it's 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 lightning metering for the phone. So if you're if you're trying to set something up and you want a light meter, how this phone is going to see that. Ah, that's um, what you should use it for, yeah. not a separate camera. Yeah, 
And okay. if you're trying to even up a green screen, you can use it because you can uh, right um, because the it's not you're not really looking at the quality of the green screen at least at first. You're you looking at uniform the lighting, uniform lighting, which you can measure with a tool like this. And so, and I'm going to show how to do that in the next couple of weeks. So I got NAB next and if week. That, if that's what you're looking for, even if you weren't using a camera phone to shoot it. The uniform lighting is uniform lighting. While right? you're setting it up, you could do you could yeah. do it this way. I mean, yeah. you still. I mean, you still want I'm to trying to. Real I'm trying to point. challenge myself to doing it with this, and but it, it's incredible that you can get scopes that are accurate and really well thought out. And and I actually know. I mean, disclaimer: Adam Wilson's been an old friend of mine for 15 years, and he's probably one of the most brilliant video engineers I know. So so he's. It's not just made by some guy that kind of read a book. Um, this is a, it's, it's a, it's got a fall. It's got a, a false color picture, color metering, a waveform monitor. This is pretty sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty so it's, sweet. it's a really cool, cool app. Um, if you want some good technical information when you're prepping to shoot with your, uh, with your iPhone and, um, Cinemeter, it's from adamwit.com. Yep. And, uh, and just a reminder that uh, we're finishing up our sale on the Pixel <gasps> Core. So, um, is there anything we put, left? Oh yeah, there's more. We put more stuff up. We keep on adding stuff. So if you go to Pixel Core, uh, if you go here and you sign up, I send out the emails to this 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 list. I'm saying, hey, we add, every week we're adding stuff. We added a bunch of new cameras and everything else. So pixelcore.com so slash sale. That's how you add into it. To get. To get. And then I'll On the you, mailing list. And then on the mailing list. And then I'll email right. you out saying, hey, we put some new stuff up. We I bought a prices. Sony EX3 from you. My home? son is out on his first shoot today. Thank nice. you. Nice. That's, Thank that's you. great. Absolutely. Uh -huh. my, I just my, joined the list. My, uh, you gave me a great deal too, by the way. I know. I, I have. Um, Do you regret it now? I got yelled at. Really? <laughs> no. I'll I got, pay. You want more? No, no, I'll give no, you no, some more fine, money. It's fine. It's fine. It, it, it was, uh, Henry's I got, really thrilled. I got into a little trouble for that one. <laughs> really? But, but, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to... Thank you, Alex. Yeah, my pleasure. You've helped start my son in his career. That's great. No, absolutely. So I appreciate it. Um, Andy and Echo, what do you got for us here? Uh, one of my favorite apps in the world, not just photo app, but favorite apps in the world, uh, Skylum Software's Noiseless CK. Uh, this is a standalone app for the Mac that will remove noise from photos. And we were talking earlier about how uh, iPhones and other mobile devices take great pictures. But then when you when you when it's not on Instagram, you just put them on your screen. You see all the ISO noise and all the clutter and all the crap. Uh, that this tiny, tiny little uh, little image uh, image uh, sensor puts on there. This will just simply remove it, and it's damn near magical. Uh, it's you, you think that oh well, it's going to make everything just too soft and remove all details. No, it is really good at figuring out what is ISO noise and what is actual picture data. Uh, and on top of that, uh, unlike the denoise filters that you might have in whatever photo editor that you're using right now, it lets you really play with this with a high level granularity. So it'll analyze your image. It will suggest a method of it, it'll suggest a level of denoise and let you preview it. And it's easy to sort of like A, B uh, through the changes to see what's happening. Uh, but then if you say, no, I want this more aggressive or I want you to use the it, it, it's the easiest, the less dis, least disruptive uh, denoising is at the top of the list. And then by the time you get to the bottom, you can get the full like Real Housewives of L.A. effect, just <laughs> erasing every single crease, every single detail and make it look almost like a watercolor. But that won't be necessary. What, what I love about it is that uh, it's. It will take whatever camera you have and trick people into thinking you have a much better camera. Uh, I used it on the uh, in the uh, the lighting inside the uh, high school auditorium at the Apple last uh, Apple event last week wasn't great because Apple couldn't. I don't think Apple could bring in the full rig of lighting that they usually bring. Uh, also, my camera, I love it to death. Uh, but it, it's a micro thirds, micro uh, four thirds camera, so it doesn't have that big sensor and the really, really good low light performance. And thirdly, I am now kind of paranoid about using like slow shutter speeds on any human being that is not sitting on a chair posing for me. Uh, so I have to <laughs> I feel like I have to use a hot to, to even to even if someone is talking, if I want it to be absolutely tack sharp, I need a high shutter speed. But knowing that I had noiseless CK uh, on my MacBook back at the hotel, I didn't care. I just shot away. Uh, the uh, shots I got out of the camera didn't look all look fine, but noisy. And the ones that uh, came after just like 15 seconds of tweaking them with noiseless looks like I brought a much, much better camera. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, roller derby season starts uh, on Saturday. I'm shooting my first match. Once again, high speed, high speed sports inside a, a hockey arena. 
I'd be dead <laughs> trying to trying to just shoot it with whatever I've got handy. But again, with noiseless, I can crank up the ISOs and know that I can basically make it look really, really good at the very very end. And so normally it's sixty bucks. It's only uh, it's down to uh, it's on sale for twenty uh, through the uh, Skylum website, and can't recommend it highly enough. No matter what camera you have, Skylum is the old Mac fun. They rebranded because they now do Windows as well as uh, Mac stuff. And they, their stuff is really good. I haven't tried yeah. Noiseless, but that price makes me want it yeah. now. Thank you, Andrew. Mr. Rene Ritchie, your pick of the week. Yeah, so I know like all the fancy console games are coming to iOS, but I wanted to shout out to a mobile game. And big surprise, it's Pokemon Go again. Leo. <laughs> they've got, they've got another big I was hoping I, Fortnite or something, but no, no Pokemon I mean, Go. It's huh? super like we're going to see a, a spate of these games soon. Like there's going to be the Harry Potter game, and there's anyone with a license. Are they still planning that? Because I really want that Harry Potter game. That would, you know, yeah, like, I think Warner is going to license beasts. the technology, though. Yeah. So, like, that who would knows? Be so but, much fun. What I like is like like th this was originally a really good mobile game because it used everything. It used screen, it used data, it used GPS. You had to get out in the real world. It, it encouraged exit. Like it was just everything that made mobile unique was present in this game. But how do you continue that? Like after you've caught a few Pokemon, you're bored. And they did updates. Like they did a new gym system and they did raids. And more recently, they did weather. So now when it's raining outside, it's raining in the game. And there's different characters and different powers and things that manifest. And the latest one is called Field Research. And now you're given, like, little quests. You have uh, – anytime you, you you spin, you get a small quest, like catch 10, of, catch, catch 10 ground Pokemon or fight in a gym or do a raid or just a little task. But there's also, like, a story mode where this Professor Willow uh, character – wants you to find the mythical Pokemon Mew, who isn't in the game yet. And you're given all these different tasks in, in different areas of the game. And some of them are really easy, you know, like spin five Pokestops or catch five Pokemon. Some are really hard, like catch a Ditto, which disguises like other Pokemon. you got to catch tons of them just to find them or evolve a Gyarados or do 20. Like, uh, they're, they're all different and you get rewards for doing each one. But at the end, you get a chance to catch this invisible mythical Pokemon. And it's it's just it's interesting to see how this technology is evolving because I expect nothing more than many many clones of this game and and games that are like this but go in all new directions and you think they're going to have a short shelf life but I'm I'm enthused that Niantic is putting the effort into make new gameplay modes at least two three times four times a year so if you haven't tried it lately there's a whole there's a whole new game that you can play inside there now I'm gonna have to uh, pick it up again I'm sorry to say yes hey we have a visitor visiting from uh, England. Craig is here. He's a member of the London Mac user group, and he says he's the first iPhone owner in the UK. Wow. Nice. Back in 2007, you must have been eight. And he brought me, <laughs> I love this. This is the the, uh, the polo shirt from the uh, London Mac user group, which has an apple with uh, the London Eye, Big Ben, and uh, St. Uh, St. Paul's uh, dome on it. And I, I love that, so... Thank you so much, Craig. It's nice to meet you. Thanks for bringing this by. And uh, cheers to the uh, the app, the uh, London Mac Users Group. That's awesome. You still have that original iPhone? So do I. <laughs> I have mine. Um, yeah, just to give you an update, uh, I'm watching a feed from uh, TikTok uh, Bloomberg of uh, the uh, situation at YouTube headquarters. It's uh, sad to say one of those pictures we've seen an awful lot lately, people leaving the headquarters and being searched by police to make sure they're not one of the shooters. Uh, we did see an ambulance speed off, so I'm going to guess there might have been some injuries, uh, but we don't have any details about what's going on uh, with the situation. Uh, our hearts go out to uh, everybody at YouTube uh, in San Bruno, and stay safe. Stay safe. Uh, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. We do Mac Break Weekly uh, Tuesdays right after iOS today, so you can make it a whole Apple fest if you want. We usually uh, kick this show off around 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. If you want to watch live, do it at our, webs our website, which is uh, twit.tv slash live. You can also uh, chat with us at irc.twit.tv if you'd like to. Um, and if you don't want to watch live on-demand audio and video of this show is always available at twit.tv slash mbw or wherever you get your podcast in fact subscribe that way you'll get an episode every time every minute it's ready thanks for being here we'll see you next time now get back to work because break time is over